Well, good morning, everybody. So good to be with you guys this week, and uh, I want to take a moment. <laughs> Didn't even plan it. I want to take a moment and just uh, commend you for your being here this week, for your investment in what matters most, your relationship with God and your relationship with your family, uh, with your spouse, uh, with your kids, whoever is here with you this week. Um, I just want to say way to go. I also want to say thank you to all of you who sponsor single parents and help them bring their kids to family camp. I was raised by a single mom. My dad uh, left when I was eight. My parents divorced at that time. And through the years, we had help. And uh, I actually felt called to full-time Christian ministry at a camp like this one. It was in Texas. And I had opportunity to go that week to camp because somebody gave me a scholarship. And so for those of you who are part of that, I want to say thank you. You never know what God might do through your giving and through your steps of obedience. To those of you that this is a tradition for you, I want to say way to go, and I want to commend you. I remember several years ago, uh, my youngest son, uh, again, <laughs> Jackson, uh, it was his birthday, and he wanted to go to Buca de Beppo. Have you ever been to Buca de Beppo? Like family-style Italian and uh, sometimes when we celebrate birthdays, not every time, but what we like to do is we go around the table and the person that it's their birthday, you know, we say nice things about them. And so uh, grandparents, grandma and grandpa were, were with us. And so it was my wife and I and Jackson, it was his birthday, it was his older brother and it was grandma and grandpa. And so we're at Buca de Beppo at one of those round tables and we start to go around the table to... Uh, tell Jackson what we love about him. And so the first person is mom, and she says some sweet things about, about Jackson. And uh, really nice, you know. And then it's big brother's turn, and he has to think for a little bit. <laughs> but he comes up with some nice things to say about his little brother, and then it's grandma, and it's grandpa, and then it's me. And uh, it, it was just great. And then Jackson said, I want to say something nice to all of you. And we're like, okay. And he goes around the table, you know, and he says something nice to everybody. He gets to me, Dad, I love you because you buy me stuff. <laughs> and one of the things that I would do, um, and I, I wish I was more consistent with it through the years, but one of the things I would do with the boys in that season is at night I would, I would bless them. That's from number six, and I would go up, you know, and put my hand on him, and I would say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May, his, may, may he make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. And sometimes if I forgot to do that, Jackson would yell down the stairs, Dad, you forgot to bless me, you know? And so I would come up and do that. But we were going around the table, and, and he's saying nice things to us now, and he tells me in this moment, Dad, I want to bless you. And so he reaches his little hand up, you know, and puts it on my chubby face and says, Dad, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Dad, may he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you. <laughs> and may he give you his peace. And then he kind of shoved my face. <laughs> this beautiful moment. And you know what I thought to myself in that moment? I thought, I'm the greatest parent in the world. <laughs> no, it's a really good moment, but, but this other thought came to mind, and it was like, oh man, he's, uh, he's watching. I had no idea he had memorized that, picked that up, could quote it, right? And, and I just want to commend you for taking this week 
to invest in what matters most and for modeling that to your kids. You're the greatest parent in the world, right? <laughs> uh, it depends on the day, doesn't it? <laughs> Our kids don't remember what we say as much as they remember who we are. And you know, you could have went on a cruise this week or to Disneyland or whatever, but you came to camp and you communicated to your kids beyond just your mouth, but with your actions, our family's about, about God being devoted to him and being devoted to each other. And so way to go, love you. Even if I don't know you, I love you, proud of you. Good job this week. And uh, I also want to remind you that holy ground is not about a place. Sometimes I'll do camps. This place is so special. Well, yeah, the trees are awesome, but God's everywhere. Holy ground is not about a place. It's about a person, and his name's Jesus. And all ground is holy ground when we give him our attention. And I love Mount Hermon, and I'm always honored to be here. Uh, it is a special place because it helps us focus on, on what matters most. And so this morning, we're going to wrap up uh, our time talking about Psalm 23. And uh, as we do that, I want to invite you to pray with me, and let's ask uh, the Spirit of God to speak to us today, and perhaps, again, you'd be willing just to turn your palms up as a posture of receiving from the Lord whatever He wants to share with you this morning. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. You're already here with us. You inhabit the praises of your people. For those who've given their life to Jesus, you reside within us. And right now, we just ask you to fully take over. I ask you to come upon me and uh, speak through me. Nobody needs to hear from me. But all of us need to hear from you. And so give us wisdom today of your, of your word. Thanks for David. Thanks for inspiring these beautiful words through his pen. Thanks that um, the people in the Bible, it's very obvious they're not perfect. And we know that about David. We know the good, the bad, and, and the ugly. And yet you specialize in drawing straight lines with crooked sticks. You, you, you work through imperfect people. That's like all you have to work with. <laughs> And so we thank you for your grace, and we lift our hands to you, and with that, our minds and hearts, uh, and we ask you to speak to us today as we talk about your wisdom. Bless these families. Bless the single moms and dads. Bless um, the grandparents that are here. Bless everybody uh, in between, just all the families represented here. I pray we would continue to model well and to live well and to speak well and to invest our lives well in what matters most. In the end, all that matters is you and people, Father. And so bless this time, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm 23, it's a psalm of relationship. David says, he and me, you and me, his goodness and love and, and me. It's a relational psalm. Uh, it's a psalm of receiving and rest because he anoints our head with oil and our cup overflows. The Christian life is primarily about receiving. It's the only faith on the planet that is that way because it runs on grace. We're not earning anything, we're receiving we're not earning, but we put forth effort. But the effort is not to earn, it's to, it's to learn. And so it's about receiving. To experience what God has for us and the teaching of Psalm 23, we must practice humility. And we talked about that yesterday. Humility is a trust word. It's a relational word. And it's really how love is exchanged. It's how love is received and how love is is, is given, and so we must be courageous enough to trust God and others with the real us. The only way to experience the real love of God and the real love of people is to be courageous enough to be the real you. By the way, just for all the guys, just to kind of spur you on along those lines a little more, all the men, do you know what a real man is? A real man 
is a man who is real. Ta-da. And then the next question is always, do you know any? (laughs) I like people who are authentic and real. The only way to experience the real love of God and the real love of people is to be courageous enough to be the real you. Nobody can love who you're pretending to be because that person does not exist. And so it's a psalm of relationship and receiving and rest, and we experience that when we practice humility. It's also a psalm of of wisdom. And we've talked a lot about receiving in the mornings this week, right, and a lot about rest. Today, we're going to talk about working it out. And we work it out in wisdom because the Christian life is learning to receive the love, the mercy, the truth of God, and then we give that away to other people. God works it in, and we work it out. Your soul is not meant to be a reservoir. It's not meant to just collect. Your soul is meant to be a river. And what do rivers do? Rivers flow. And so as springs of living water, Jesus said this to the woman at the well, by the power of his spirit, well up in us and our receiving and our our resting and our living in his grace, as God is working that in us, we work it out amongst us. Sometimes when we talk about discipleship in the church, I'll just tell you as a pastor, we way overcomplicate it. So a lot of people in my church, especially the men that I spend time with, and they feel like they have to be a reader if they're going to follow Jesus. I don't like to read. I don't know if I can do any of this, right? And I'll say something like, well, you realize the bulk of the population for hundreds and hundreds of years was illiterate after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Tons of people could not read. Do you think nobody was following Jesus? But what have we done over time? We make it about edutainment. I made that word up. (laughs) Education and entertainment. A good service was I laughed and was entertained and I learned something new. And we think that's discipleship. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Discipleship is as simple as your next step of obedience. I'm going to say it one more time. Discipleship is as simple as as your next step of obedience. We're going to talk about godly wisdom today. Listen close. Wisdom is not just about what you know. Wisdom is about what you show. Again, I try not to rhyme, but I do it all the time. Okay. (laughs) Wisdom is not just about what you know. It's about what you show. There are lots of educated fools. Wisdom is about how you live. It's about obedience. And when it comes to obedience, the problem is not that we don't love God enough. The problem is that we don't realize how much he loves us. Because here's the thing. If you realized how much God loves you, you would always do what he says. If we could see what God sees, we would always do what he says. You ever have this moment with your kid Where you're like, why'd you do that? And what do they usually say? I don't know. And my thought is, what do you mean you don't know? Right? But they're just being honest. And sometimes I'll be like, especially as my older son became a a teenager, I'd be like, dude, would you just trust me? I can see what you can't see. I know what you don't know. Would you just please do what I say? It's for your good. I love you. And I'll be like, dude, are you smarter now that you're 15? Or were you smarter when you were seven? I'm smarter now that I'm 15. Well, at the time, right? I'm like, I'm 46 years old. I know a lot more than you do. I can see what you can't see. I know what you don't know. Would you just please do what I say, right? My commands for him, my rules for him are because I love him. And discipleship is as simple as your next step of obedience. But here's the thing. The more that you understand God's love for you, the more that you'll do what he says. Even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't see it, even when you don't understand it, 
Because when you can't trace his hand and you don't see the plan, when you understand his love, you'll trust his heart. Our problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our problem is we don't realize how much he loves us. And so as we talk about his everlasting love, that fuels us for obedience. How do you know if you love God? Well, I get goosebumps in worship. No, no, no. Goosebumps, good. I, I enjoy that. John 14, 21 says this. Jesus is speaking. He who has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. It's, it's like, this, like this snowball that just rolls. The more we obey, the more we understand. There's so many things you won't understand about God until you do what he says, right? It's like when you get older, you know, and your parents got smarter as you got older. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm waiting for my kids to get older. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Discipleship is as simple as your next step of what? Obedience. Obedience. We just do what he says. Why? Because we have some understanding that he loves us, and in that we trust him. All faith leads to obedience. To believe is to trust, and to trust is to obey. That's biblical faith. To believe is to trust, and to trust is to obey. Faith is not wishing on a star and hoping, you know, and God, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. We all pray like a Spice Girl, don't we? <laughs> God, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. As if God were like, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> Real relational good prayer leads us to, to obedience, to trusting God, to doing what he says. To believe is to trust, and to trust is to what? Obey. Obey. So let's talk about it. Here's the line. Psalm 23, if you haven't memorized it, I hope that you will do that. Um, I, this morning, was drinking my cup of coffee, sitting in the room. I was shivering just a little bit because I'm an Arizona boy. I just quoted the psalm out loud. This is, this is verse 3. It says that he refreshes our souls. And then it says he guides me along the right paths. The word path here is what I want you to think about. He guides me, obviously think about that, along the right paths for his name's sake. Wisdom, foolishness, simpleness is about the path you choose to walk. You cannot not be on a path. Everybody is on a path. It would be David's son, Solomon, that would write a whole book on the principle of the path. The principle of the path in your Bible is the book of Proverbs. Now, Proverbs does not mean promises. Proverbs is about the principle of the path. Proverbs is full of principles. These little statements about life that are genuinely, usually true. Okay? Now, this is really important. I'm going to bust some of your bubble, and what I'm about to say is going to bother some of you, but I'm, I'm telling you for your own good. Okay? I'm going to give you an example. You're not going to like the example I'm going to give, but it'll help us get to the place of understanding what Proverbs actually is. Okay? So for example, if you think Proverbs are promises, there's a chance you're going to get disappointed, and you're going to be confused about who God is and does he keep his promises. Proverbs aren't promises. Proverbs are principles. Okay? And the whole book of Proverbs is about the principle of the path, okay? For example, one of the Proverbs is train a child in the way they should go, right? And when they're old, they'll not depart. That is a principle, not a promise. Because sometimes our kids go astray. My kid's gone astray. And he's come back, thank God. He's still in process, like all of us, right? But that, that's a principle, that's a proverb, but that kid's got free will. Don't you hate that? <laughs> Why don't they just have my will? It's a proverb. It's a principle. It's how things usually work out, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, if right now you've got a rebellious kid, I want to give you some hope. 
a couple of three years ago, uh, my oldest son, uh, kind of in a rebellious period and friends and things that we didn't like, you know, and he's just in the process of growing up. He's a pastor's kid, right? And so he's going to rebel a little bit. And I was talking to a mentor of mine. His name's Larry, uh, pastors a church called North Coast in uh, Southern California. And I'm like, Larry, Josh would drive me crazy. I'm like, I don't know what to do with him. And, and Larry, for me, uh, through the years, I, I talked about my parents are divorced. Larry's like a father figure to me, and he's spoken a lot of wisdom in, in, my, in my life. And he says, Chad, just relax. He goes, you don't have any idea who he's going to be till he's 30. <laughs> and I'm like, I got 15 more years of this crap? <laughs> like, this, is, this is hard. Like, I don't know if I want to do this, you know? And he's like, think about it, think about it, think about it. Who is the perfect parent? Let's all answer the question. Who's the perfect parent? God. Okay. God, who is the perfect parent, puts his first two kids in a perfect environment. You can't get any more perfect. Perfect parent, perfect environment. And what do those two kids do? They rebel. He's like, welcome to humanity. Your son's growing. And then he said this, such brilliant advice. He goes, Chad, play the long game. Don't, don't argue about things that don't really matter with him. Right, right now, pick your battles. Go for the relationship long-term, build trust, and play the long game. And he said, and most likely, this is a principle, he said, most likely, you're going to see fruit come out of that. And, and so far, as, as things are playing out, that's, that's, that's what's happening. But if right now you got a kid in rebellion, I'm, I'm going I'm to pray for that here at the end of our time. But I'll just tell you, you know, God's perfect parent, perfect environment. Those kids still rebelled. <laughs> well, welcome to reality, all right? Proverbs is the principle of the path, okay? He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, the first question to ask, right, is what path are you on? Because direction, not intention, determines destination. I learned that from another pastor. Direction, not intention, determines destination. And you cannot not be on a path. For example, if you want to go to Disneyland, it doesn't matter how bad you want to go. It doesn't matter that you listen to Disney songs and you're wearing ears. It doesn't matter that you got a Disney t-shirt on. If you're headed north, you're not going to Disneyland. You're headed to Oregon, right? (laughs) If you're going to go to Disneyland, it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what you sing in the car as you're heading somewhere, right? It doesn't matter that you got Mickey Mouse ears on. None of those things matter. What matters is what direction you are going. This is the principle of the path. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what you intend in it. What matters is which direction are you going. This is the principle of the path. If God is guiding you, it will be a path of righteousness for his namesake. And the beautiful thing about a path of righteousness is it's always the right path. Why? Because righteousness means right. Rightness is righteousness. And so he guides us along the right path. It's not about intention. It's about direction. Two ways we get direction from God. One, a direct word by his spirit. That's called a rhema. It's special. He whispers to us. Anytime God whispers to you, it will fall in line with what the Bible teaches principally. If it does not fall in line with what the Bible teaches principally, it's not from God. It's the pizza you ate last night, or it's another spirit at work, or it's your own sinful nature. So one of the things I pray all the time for my family and for myself is God protect me from the schemes of the enemy. Protect me from myself, because nobody lies to me more than me. I even have a word for it. I call it rationalizing, and I'm telling myself rational lies, and all of us do it. So God, protect me from the schemes of the devil. Protect me from myself. Protect me from thinking worldly thoughts. And I pray that over my kids, all right? Right path, direction, which way are we we headed? God might speak to you, okay? That's, That's a word, and if he speaks to you, it'll fall in line with what the Bible says, okay? He, he won't go against his word. If you don't have a word from God, then you practice what we're talking about today, wisdom, because all wisdom comes from God, right? Word, wisdom. 
all decisions in life. Word, wisdom, all decisions in life. Say it with me, word and, and wisdom. Great thing to teach your kids. What's the wise thing to do? Best question ever. And all wisdom comes from God. So let's break it down because he guides us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We are going to look at Proverbs. Uh, David's son Solomon wrote most of those because Proverbs are principles. And we're talking about choosing wisdom this morning. Choosing wisdom. Proverbs talks about three kinds of people, actually four. Uh, the notes are on three. There's a fourth kind of person that Proverbs talks about that we're not going to talk about this morning, but I am going to tell you what it is. Um, we're going to break it down in a second. Uh, we're not going to do the notes yet. We'll do them one at a time. But there's the simple, there's the fool, there's the wise. And then the fourth kind of person that Proverbs talks about is the evil. Um, some people just want to watch the world burn. And Proverbs talks about what, it, what do we do with those kinds of people. But today, we're going to talk about the three main types, the simple, the fool, and the wise. So choosing wisdom. First type of person that Proverbs talks about is the simple. And simple people just don't know, okay? Simple people aren't thinking about their life. They're just living life. Simple people are not proactive. They're always reactive, okay? Uh, a simple person has no intentionality about their life. They're just kind of in survival mode. They're just kind of going with the flow, all right? Now, the truth is all of us are all three of these kinds of people, simple, full, wise, depending on what we're talking about in our lives. But there's some areas in our life we're just simple-minded. We're not intentional at, at all. A couple things that I wrote down here, just thinking about this. Let's look at the verse first. This is Proverbs 14, 15. It says, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his, what's the next word? When you read Proverbs, notice how many times it talks about steps, walks, and paths. Because Proverbs is the principle of the path. All right? He guides me in paths of, of righteousness for his name's sake. The simple are reactive, not, not proactive. A couple things I wrote down. You want to proactively plan so that you are not reactively regretful. Write this down if you're taking notes. It's a great thing to teach our kids. The first step to getting what you want out of life is deciding what it is you want. I'm going to say it one more time. Worked really hard on it. The first step to getting what you want out of life is deciding what it is that you want. Why? Because it's not about intention. It's about direction. What path are you on? Where are you headed? Well, I hope, well, I feel, where I intend. No, no, no. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where do you want to end up? Begin with the end in mind. Simple people don't think that way. Simple people are running around with no compass. Okay? So let's think about it. Uh, in your marriage right now, if you're married, where do you want that thing to go? Now, looking around the room... We're all kind of in different seasons in our marriage. Where's your marriage going? If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. Is that what you want? What do you want your marriage to look like a year from now? And what kind of steps do you need to take to get there? That's just the principle of the path. Again, not what you hope, not what you feel, not what you intend. Hope is not a strategy. Hope's a good thing, but it's not a strategy. You have to decide what you want and then make plans of how to get there. This is a biblical principle. Sometimes people in my church, when I talk about planning and strategy and thinking through things, that doesn't sound very spiritual. I'll be like, you realize God has a plan. <laughs> like we're right in the middle of it. God's already told us what the end's going to look like. Okay? That's to give us hope to know where he's headed. So we follow him to get there. Make sense? Planning is very much part of the way God wired us. Human beings are the only mammals on the planet that create something out of nothing. This is part of what it means to be in the image of God. We can visualize things and create it. Okay? So where are you 
going. When you think about goals for your life and, and, and things like that, one of the godly things that you can do is not just have goals of what you're going to achieve, but have goals in the realm of the kind of person God wants you to become. If there's things about yourself that you know need to change, what steps, habits, things do you need to put in place to see that change actually come to pass? Why? It's the principle of the path. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Simple people don't think about the path. They're just living their life, bouncing around. What we want to do is, is we want to think through it. Parenting. What do you want that to look like? One of these days, you're going to be dead. What do you want people to say about you at your funeral? One of my goals is nobody has to lie about me at my funeral. You ever been in a funeral where you knew everybody's lying? It's terrible, right? I, I, I ripped this off from Rick Warren, so I'm going to give him credit, but I heard him say this, and I, I borrowed it, and I've made it mine. Success for me is that the people who know me the best respect me the most. It's not followers on Instagram, you know, or, or some type of, of achievement. It's that when I'm dead and gone and my kids are talking about me at, at the funeral, they don't have to lie or try to think of something good to say. There's memories that they can talk about. There's moments in life that are special to them. All these things, all right, you, you don't want to live simple. You, you, you want to think about where things are, are going. It's, it's good and right to ask God to help you plan your life. Not just what you want to achieve, but who God wants you to become. So the simple, they just don't know. They believe everything. Uh, they're not thinking about their steps. The prudent gives thought to his steps. So you want to begin with the end of mind. What do you want to see? Second kind of person is the fool. Number two, the foolish. The foolish know but don't do. Foolishness is the gap between knowing the right thing to do and actually doing it. And so a fool like knows the right thing to do, but they don't do it. Make sense? Okay. Fool is that gap. Are, am I simple? Am I fool? Am, 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 I, am I wise? Uh, we're all simple and foolish in various ways. Uh, this is Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. I wrote this down, don't just wish it, work it. Don't just wish it, work it. Uh, one of the things that I'll tell our church when we talk about these things is here's how life works. You want to pray as though it all depends on God, and you want to work as though it all depends on you. When we talk about rest and resting in God and rest for our souls, we're not talking about an absence of work. For example, I was talking to somebody yesterday. I don't remember who I said this to. But like uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, okay, Jesus says like, hey, consider the birds of the air. He's talking about worry. So you know the song, His Eye is on the Sparrow? Okay. Sparrows work. The early bird gets the worm. Sparrows work, but sparrows don't worry. That's the difference. What we're talking about in Psalm 23 is learning to rest even in the middle of our work. You realize David was a shepherd. He's finding the wonder of God in his work. There are two things that will stress you out. One is never resting and the other is never working. We live in the tension of those two things. Because God wants us to produce. Now some of us work in the home. Some of us work outside the home. The idea is that we're contributing. This is God's will for us to, to, work it, to work it out. Fools know the right thing to do, but they don't do it. Reaping what you sow is a biblical principle throughout. Okay? So sometimes I'll talk to young adults in our church, and they're dreaming about their ship coming in. They're dreaming about this happening, and they, they're waiting on it to happen. And I'll be like, stop waiting on your ship to come in. Go ahead and swim out to the boat. Wishing on a star won't get you very far. You think you're waiting on God? God's waiting on you. By the way, you may tell you what waiting on God means. This is how that plays out functionally. To wait on God 
is to do what you can do until God does what only he can do. Waiting on God is doing what you can do until God does what only he can do. And so sometimes when you're looking for something in life and, and, you're, and you're working it out, to be foolish is to do nothing. What you want to do is you want to make a list. These are things that I have control of, and these are things that are out of my control. Things that you have control of, you do something about that. If you need to go to counseling, do that. Why? Because wise people get help. If you need to get some coaching, do that. If you need to get some help, do that. Have you ever heard this before, time heals all wounds? Anybody ever heard that? Let me help you. That's not true. Just think with me. If time healed all wounds, anytime you're sick and you're waiting in the waiting room to see the doctor, you'd be well by the time you went in for your appointment. Because <laughs> you're waiting there a long time, right? Can I get a witness? Okay. I know lots of people in their 60s still dealing with wounds in their childhood. Time doesn't heal all wounds. Jesus does. To heal from it, you got to deal with it. Fools don't deal with it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you something I will do is I have a junk drawer. Junk drawer is where I put all the stuff I don't want to deal with. <laughs> Problem with the junk drawer is it piles up. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we, we, we reap what we, what we sow. We, we have to work it out with God. We pray as though it all depends on God. We work as though it all depends on us. You make your list. What can I, what can I do? Okay, I'm going to do that. And then the things that are out of my control, I'm going to give that to the Lord. And I want to pray hard about those things. And God kind of meets us in the middle. You work as though it all depends on God. You pray as though it all depends on you. Simple people aren't planning. They're not thinking. They're just living their life. Fools know the right thing to do, but they don't do it. And fools will say stuff like, especially in church, because Christians say a lot of stupid things. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, you're not. He's waiting on you. Waiting on the Lord is not wishing. Waiting on the Lord is doing what you can do until God does what only he can do. Make sense? Okay, so we don't want to be simple, and we don't want to be foolish. Number three, here's what we want to be. We want to be wise. Wise people know the right thing to do, and they do it. It's knowing and doing. Knowing and doing. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So it's Proverbs 14, 16. One who is wise is cautious, thinking about their life, paying attention, and turns away from evil. But a fool is reckless and careless. Wise people thinking about their life. God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? This is a prayer that my wife Katrina taught me. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? It's a great prayer. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? This is Proverbs 12, 15. You know this one. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. You want to have wise people around you, you want to ask people that love you to tell you the truth. You want people around you that care more about your future than they do your feelings. I want somebody that will hurt my feelings if it's for my good. Uh, in modern time, none of us are listening to learn anymore. In modern time, we're listening to decide whether or not we agree or disagree. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'll just tell you that doing that is foolish. I'm going to be a pastor for just a second. And I'm going to, in God's sense of humor, step into a place of the authority that God's given me in his sense of humor on, on my life. Listen close. If God always thinks like you, acts like you, votes like you, if God always does what you would do, you don't worship the real God. You worship a Stepford version of him. You, you, you worship a figment of your own imagination and you've created him in your own image. God will rock you, shake you, move you, change you for the rest of your life. Because God is very, very big and you are very, very small. And God is very, very wise and we are very, very foolish. You always want to be learning. You always want to have a posture of humility. Humility is not timidity. It takes a lot of courage to be humble. Humility is simply honesty. It's the realization that I don't know everything. I want to encourage you to listen to your enemies because even a broken clock is right twice a day. And there's probably something that we can learn. 
Um, I get criticized a lot. You want to know why? Because I'm not perfect. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people every weekend. Usually, if you lead anything, about 10% of whoever you're leading have some critical thoughts about you, right? So once you get to like 10,000, you got 1,000 critics. Make sense? Okay. Sometimes, I don't even think about my critics. Sometimes, I overthink my critics, I'll have 99 compliments and one criticism. I forget the 99 compliments and I hang the criticism on the wall. That's not good either. We have to live in this tension. But here's the thing. In all criticism, there's usually a little bit of truth. An opportunity for growth and and change. Wise people listen to advice. Wise people are paying attention. Wise people are humble and teachable. So let God shake you up every once in a while. Consider the fact that you might be wrong. What drives me crazy, like in our church, because a third of our people come from a Catholic background, a third no church background at all, a third various conservative, evangelical, whatever. That's what makes up Sun Valley Community Church. All kinds of people. So I got people from all kinds of paradigms, all kinds of walks of life. They all vote differently. It's like New Testament, like the Jews and the Gentiles that couldn't get along. Are you guys with me? Like the very religious and the very irreligious. That's, that's, that's my church. And one of the things that drive me crazy is everybody's listening for a soundbite. Because if I say those words, I must mean this. And we've lost the ability to think and process and consider and actually practice wisdom. And so let's be wise. Wise people listen. They're, they're teachable. They know the right thing to do. And they, and they do it. Proverbs 13, 20, and then we'll pray. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. We want to be around wise people, people that we admire. We obviously want to get God's word in our life. We want to walk the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. One of the reasons why we want the fruit of the spirit evident in our lives is because we're carrying around the name of Jesus And one of the things that crushes me anytime somebody in my role messes up or it comes out they did something years ago or whatever, I hurt for them, I hurt for their family, I hurt for the church, and I hurt for the name of Jesus. May may all of us be humble enough, be honest enough, be accountable enough to walk the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I give you a prayer that I pray all the time and then I want to pray over you. God, give me the wisdom to know the right thing to do and the courage to do it. God, give me wisdom to know the right thing to do and the courage to do it. Let's walk in wisdom. Let's let God work it in and let's work it out and let's follow his path. I'm going to speak a blessing over you and pray for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you. And may he give you his peace. Father, give us wisdom to know the right things to do and the courage to do it. Thank you that we can rest in you which means our work and our walk is not in fear. It's not in stress. It's a walk of peace. But we work hard. We understand. We'll reap what we sow. You've given us free will. And so may we not be simple. May we think about where things are going. May we understand that life is full of the path. We're headed somewhere. May we not be fools. May may we think about what we're actually doing, not just hoping or feeling. Father, may we be wise and know the right thing to do and do it for your name's sake. And so grant us your wisdom and guide us in paths of righteousness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.